Ooh, this one is good. Coming up, an all-time rock hit is put under the microscope and taken apart by the entire band. This one has a lot of layers to it. First of all, it didn't become a hit until a year after the band had actually broken up. Its unique hand claps and audible breathing made it one of the, the most unique million-selling hits ever. And it contained a phrase that would become part of our everyday vernacular from that point on. Then the label was ready to give up on this legendary album that the song came from. It was saved at the last minute. But even then, the record's title was misspelled, and it still hasn't been corrected. Then to add uh, insult to injury, when the song hit the top of the charts, you know, with the band broken up, a promoter put out a fake version of the band and began to tell people that the lead singer had died. The lead singer found out about his own death when he was reading about it in the paper. Amazing story is coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, today's interview really cool stuff. Before we get into it, I do want to invite you to subscribe below right now so that you get our daily features on the stories of the song straight from the legends. Also, take a look at our Patreon. We just released a new documentary there and your support helps us keep it a daily channel. Man, I am jazzed about this one. A couple of weeks ago, we covered this Rock Hall of Fame uh, band's iconic number two hit. But today we're going to talk about this band with this band, about their signature song. It's become a true standard of the pop canon. So we induct it into our new standards program for transcending culture, fads, and era. It's the monumental hit, Time of the Season by the Zombies. The of the season for As I said in the intro, when the Zombies released this legendary album that the song came from, uh, 1968's Odyssey and Oracle, I mean, an album that's considered a masterpiece now, but back then, it almost wasn't released by Columbia Records, who had a little faith in it. It took record man and producer Al Cooper of Blood, Sweat, and Tears fame to convince then-label head Clive Davis to actually take a chance on it. And then when the single Time of the Season started making its way to the top of the charts, the band was no longer together. They had broken up. In fact, tensions had run high during the recording of this song. Uh, between lead singer Colin Blundstone and the song's writer Rod Argent, when Rod wanted Colin to sing a certain lyric. Apparently, there was quite the, the heated discussion when uh, Colin was singing <laughs> about peace and love. Pretty funny. And then the song and record was released, and they actually misspelled the album's title, Odyssey and Oracle. For years, they said that they actually did it on purpose, but finally, a few years ago, the band admitted it was just a mistake and they let it stand. It's never been corrected. This makes for a great story. The final straw for this topsy-turvy story of this song is that it sold a million copies in America and it was a hit all over the world. But in their native country, in the UK, the song was released three different times and it was never a hit. And finally, after this song became a surprise hit in America a full year after the band had broken up, a greedy promoter in Michigan put together a fake version of the group, the Zombies. He sent them out on tour to take advantage of this hit, you know, being played on radio all over. And since no singer could really imitate the great Colin Blundstone, the promoter told the press and everybody else that Blundstone had died. But the band had agreed to go on without him. The real Blundstone was surprised to learn of his own death while reading a newspaper. Now he laughed it off and he ended up keeping the clipping explaining his death as a keepsake. In the upcoming interview, the band breaks down this song, its iconic phrase, who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? They also break down the, the hip, cool breathing slash hand clap vocal. Let's get into this interview. It's always a treat. As we sit down with these guys, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the brand of glasses that I always wear. Zenny is truly amazing because you can design your own pair of glasses, what looks great on you, and you can do a virtual try-on at their website before you purchase. You can add other amazing features for up to 80% off of regular retail prices. Just click on the link, the info button right up here or a link below to get the best deal. Here are the zombies. Well, let's talk about the hauntingly cool, psychedelic, 
standard of the Universal Songbook, Time of the Season. Number three on the Billboard charts, number one on Cashbox. Good old Number Cashbox. one in Canada. Number two on the South African hit parade as well. Okay. How it didn't chart in the UK is one of life's great mysteries, but a huge song nonetheless, even though it didn't chart it, it really almost like it was the number one hit because of how popular that is. Although it has that distinctive 60s psychedelic sound, pop feel, but it's maintained this transcendent coolness that kids today growing up just love. It's the time of the season. And it manifests how gifted you guys are as artists because I think it was a combination of all the things that you guys brought together. And I wanna ask each of you a little bit about it. Start with you, Rod, writing it lyrically I mean, what's your name? Who's your daddy? That brought that into the popular lingo. Who's your dad? I can't believe that, but that's, you know, someone from a, a, um, a big sports program. There was a Super Bowl on or something, and they said, we're playing it tonight, you know. They said, because we've looked back, and the first time we can hear uh, that Who's Your Daddy has ever been used, you know, was, was in time of the season. Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Is he rich like me? So, you know, it's the first time I heard somebody say that, but um, really, it, I mean, that song, it was the last song to be written on yeah. MC and Oracle. And Chris and I were sharing a flat. I quite believe that Chris can't remember this, but I remember having written that last song and playing it to him and saying, I think this could be a hit. And, and no one else seemed to sort of share that feeling at the time, but I, I, I like the simplicity of it. Um, I just like the whole feeling of it. I like the fact that it introduced some left field improvisation on it. That we'd had in She's Not There in a way as well. So it was like a, a, a completing the circle. But I have to say also when we recorded it, um, Jeff Emmerich, that was one of the tracks on the album that Jeff Emmerich recorded. Now he didn't mix it, but he recorded it, Peter Vince mixed it, but he recorded it. And I remember thinking that what we'd worked out between us, that, that Tom and uh, bass thing together, uh, Tom Toms and bass uh, playing together. He got a, a sound that was so moody mm. out of that. And I remember at that moment, you know, before it was mixed or anything, thinking, you know, this sounds great. This sounds really special. And, and, you know, and I think that Jeff's influence on that, which was very quick, it, it was recorded very quickly, I think that was very important. What's your name? Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? But the who's your daddy thing really came from when I was writing the lyric. Um, one of our favourite songs has always been Gershwin in Summertime. And um, your dad is rich and your mum is good looking was a line in that. Oh, your dad is rich and your mom is good. Now, that was written in more of a psychedelic way the time of the season one. And, it, and the richness wasn't about material richness. It was more about um, has he taken you, has he taken the time to show you what you need to live? To show, to show you what you need. You know, in other words, it, it was influenced by that whole feeling at the time that you've got to pass, you know, like I, um, Graham Nash, teach your children well. Teach your children well. You know, it was, it was that feeling of richness. And it was those two things really coming together that, that formed the basis of the lyric on that song. Tell it to me slowly, tell you why I really... Chris, the song, it's built around that bass line, a bass riff punctuated with the hand clap and the, the breathing, the <sighs> Whose idea was that? Well, tell me about it. It's his that. song, it's Rod's idea. But the best bit is that Hugh and I play it ourselves. We're the only people starting the song off of the booth on the stage. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah it's absolutely. just the two of you, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, just, just the, the two of us. Rhythm section, you know. Best rhythm section yeah. in the world. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I always say that. <laughs> Once again, the, that, that um, drum pattern was created mostly, I would say, 75% by Rod and myself. And we just said, you know, should we try this, do that, do that, and put it with the bass guitar 
and and suddenly it was there and the kit was recorded in exactly the same spot as Ringo's kit was recorded in that same studio with the drum head off and uh, the exactly the same miking as he as he'd done with um, Ringo so but me oh was it and, yeah same, and the same kit same kit yeah, yeah. same kit wow. same, my own kit but it was right, I went from by Ringo as you know and bought exactly the same kit yeah. as he had thought so it's good enough for Ringo it's good enough for me <laughs> and then of course the the part where it's the time of the season originally had the full backing with it but oh, we, yeah. yeah we pulled it out we did didn't we yeah, that's right and that was a very quick idea on the yeah, mix yeah, that's right, mix why don't we do this yeah. <laughs> okay that's me yeah. Mr. Yeah. And all ones, yeah. true gosh well these elements i mean they add these sonic textures that really put that song in a league of its own but most songs at that time were hitting you over the head with the chorus right hitting you hard with the chorus and your chorus it's the time of the season for loving eight seconds long you say it three times, so that's 24 seconds of the song. Season for but I think that that's why it had so much impact, because it was like this minimalist approach that gave that, those lyrics a huge impact in the time that it was released, because it peaked in 69. Yeah. And that was at a time where, I mean, significant things were happening, social, political landscape of the 60s at that time, and that meant so much. It's kind of strange because it was actually recorded in the summer of 67. I know. So it wasn't recorded at the time that people were hearing it. And sometimes people could say, you know, this was just right for that moment. Yeah. But when you're writing, recording songs, actually, you have to be ahead of what's happening. You can't, because it takes time to promote and uh, uh, to all the other things that go with releasing a record. You have to be ahead of, of things, you know. A&R men always make that mistake of saying, this, this is the number one record, write something like this, but by the time you've written it, yeah. recorded it, it's ready to go into the shops, it's, it's old, you know. So that song was actually written and recorded two years before it was a hit. And, and it's like m most of the songs that we had, nobody thought it was commercial. No. And, and, and I mean, I don't think, even when She's Not There, when we did that, first of all, the record company wasn't sure that, because it wasn't like the other right. hit records of the time. And people, were, and people from record companies would always say, you should be recording things more like this, you know, mm -hmm. and they would play what just been a hit, you know. I mean, this just used to happen all the time. And when people heard Time the Season, Al Cooper thought it was a hit, but Clive Davis didn't, you know. And so he put it back and put it well, back. Clive and Davis the wasn't even going to release the album. No. Um, Al Cooper did a very brave thing because it was his first day as a producer at CBS and he went in and saw Clive Davis who was the absolute top of CBS and he said whatever it costs you have to get this album and release it and Clive Davis said we already own it and we weren't going to release it but Al Cooper managed to encourage him to release it but even then they released I think four singles in yeah. all time of the season was the fourth single last yeah. gasp yeah last <laughs> gasp yeah. Yeah. And and that's so the saying goes the first track they released was Butcher's Tale which is by no means a single anywhere right. whatsoever great song though yeah. oh yeah but, but it, it was mm. because of Vietnam and everything but there was no chance of that being a hit Well, I want to talk about the vocal. Before we jump into that, though, I, I do want to just put a bow on this. Uh, the drum and then the clap and the bass line and the, ah. Like, where did that come from? That is just so amazing. We would prepare a song, uh -huh. and, and that ah, was, was not on the prepared song. It just had a backbeat to it. It had the tom-tom thing mm -hmm. on the backbeat. Mm -hmm. And then, because we had two extra tracks, or whatever it was, uh, I said to Hugh, do you know what, I can hear I said, what about this? I can hear a clap just before the backbeat and a ah oh, afterwards. Great. He said, well, go and do it then. So we played it through. One I might take, have done the clap and he did the one ah. take, One take, just ah, and that was it. And it was, it was improvisation. It was just a spur of the moment thing. Wow. Well, that vocal, I mean, it's, it's like the sexy, mysterious vocal, um, your approach to that because I read that you and Rod had a little spat because of the, of the line, right? And tell me about that and your approach to that, because that vocal is just so haunting. Well, generally Mind speaking, with the Odyssey and Oracle, because we had such a small recording budget, we rehearsed really extensively at every track, except for time of the season, because it was the last thing that was written. And it was finished in the morning before we went into the studio in the afternoon. Yeah. So to be honest, 
I didn't know the song that well when we got there in the afternoon. We were in Studio 3, Rob was in the control room with all the guys, and I wasn't getting the phrasing quite right. And Rod, bless him, was encouraging me. And, trying and he was to, being an irritated bugger. <laughs> he was trying to explain <laughs> the phrasing. And I remember that in front of me, I had a big clock with a red, red light was on, we're recording. I knew that money was running out and I'd got this bloody clock right in front of me. <laughs> and he kept saying, Colin, no, it, it's not that. You've got to push that. You've got to be on the beat here. And it got to the point, it, everything got a bit tense. And so I'm shouting down the microphone to him, if you're so bloody clever, you get in here and you bloody sing it. And he said to me, you're the bloody lead singer. You stay there till you get it, you stand there till you get it bloody right. And I, I love that feeling because when I'm singing, it's the time of the season for loving. I want you to remember what was going on. <laughs> we were screaming at one another. And I said, what say? Sake, we weren't Colin. saying bloody. <laughs> we were saying another word. Yeah. So, you know, it's a very dreamy uh, performance and dreamy lyric and everything. Show you what you need to live. Tell it to me. But there was quite a lot of grit going on in the background. Honestly, <laughs> that was the nicest thing you ever said to me up to that point. So I didn't <laughs> want to. Well, the organ solo was just on fire. It's really a lost art, the organ solo. At that time, you know, Wider Shade of Pale Helen and Gato De Vida, uh, Iron Butterfly. But you were just killing it on that. And was that really just improvised in the moment? Or yeah. Tell me about no, that. No, it was improvised. And the thing is, I have heard, and I don't know where I've heard this, but I, I have heard an alternative take with a completely different organ solo on it. They, no, they were, and, and it was the same as she's not there. They were, they were totally improvised, and you know it then becomes something that you you get close to. No, no, actually, it's still improvised, and yeah. and, and I always extend it on stage. I always love playing time the season, yeah. and sometimes it goes on and on and on and on. Yeah, I can tell you something. Used, else. To, used to kill us too, um, as as Rod said, it, it killed, but it killed us lugging that perishing organ into the <laughs> studio because then it oh, was yeah. the full Hammond, the organ full Hammond organ, and Leslie. But also, I remember, Rod, uh, why we might have heard a different one is because we were still short on tracks. Sometimes we had different things later on the tracks. Mm. And Rod did a great solo. Then he found out there was a, another solo on another one. We had the mm. end of a solo, so we switched them across. Yeah, so. yeah, no, no, true, yeah. And the all. background vocals on Time of the Season, just unheard of. I don't but think very quick. come yeah. close. Done very quickly. Song has dominated pop culture. I mean, it's interpolated by many, sampled by many. Like 2009, of course, Melanie Fione, yeah. Give It To Me Right. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, he's got my number right. Eminem, the track, Rhyme or Reason. Colossal brain is thoughts are entertaining, but docile and impossible to explain it. I'm also vain and probably find a way to... Yeah, yeah, see yeah. That? Oh, right. yeah. That, that, that was very track. clever because he completely... Um, turned on its head, the yeah. meaning, but with sound alike, vowels and yeah. words and everything, you know. So it's the time of the season for loving became, there's no rhyme or no reason for nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And that was just a very clever thing, actually, I oh, thought, great, I liked right. it. No no cool boy Q with Rolling Stone. <laughs> and then Don't Look Back, Miguel. Dave Matthews has covered it. But his live version, he just stops singing. He lets the crowd just I love take it. it. It's cool. Guess who covered it? America covered it. Insane Clown Posse covered it. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. wow. Oh, there you go. And then you probably knew this, but Cannon Pop artist Samuel, I don't know if I'm saying his last name right, Hui, uh, Samuel Hui, he released it as a single in Hong Kong in the 70s, and it was one of the first songs to popularize Western music. Really? To help bring that about. Absolutely. Goodness me, no, I've know. never heard that name. 
And then in movies, it was using Awakenings, and oh, that yeah, was yeah. really cool. Of course. That was so cool, that Good hearing film. it in we Awakenings. We went to the premiere of that, didn't we? Yeah. What's that? It's rock and roll. It was in Friends, too. What? You missed the exit. <laughs> Austin Powers, the spy that shagged me. It was in All the Money in the World, The Conjuring, Riding the Bullet, yeah. Shanghai Nights, the Vietnam documentary. Friends used it twice. You're right. Yeah, Two different right. episodes they used you did. it. It's been very kind to us. Uh, and and talking take... about um, Odyssey and Oracle, I, what, one of my favorite series last year that I watched was The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Oh, yes. Gosh, yes. And, and at the end of the second series, I couldn't believe it because it was a very moving moment. And right at the end, and because it was the, at the end of the last series, they played This Will Be Our Year, and they played it from note one to the dying yep, away of the final. Yeah. Because you didn't have this thing like when you watch a series where it cuts to the next episode after about 20 seconds. Because it was the last one, they just played the whole thing out. And I thought, oh. Also, it's been used in Good Girls Revolt, NCIS, Cold Case, but South Park also used it twice. The Simpsons, mm -hmm. American Simpsons, Idol. Yeah. Commercials, you know, it's been used in so many commercials. Yeah. This album has influenced so many people Paul Weller has called it his favorite album. He still goes out and buys copies for people that haven't got. I love it. He said, and I played on two tracks on his new album, and he told me uh, on the session, he said, I still go out and buy copies for people. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about this all-time 60s masterpiece. What are your memories of the zombies in this laid-back, ultra-cool song? What are your thoughts on Odyssey and Oracle? It's such an amazing album. Actually, we talked track by track on the album. Let us know if you'd like to see that interview portion. And uh, if you like our content, we do invite you to join our community by subscribing to the channel below. You can also become an honorary producer. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friend.